closed captioning of this program is made possible by the Fireman's Fund Foundation. President Obama dines and chats with Silicon Valley execs the same week a report shows a slight improvement in the Valley's job outlook. A 45-year-old tax break for farmers to keep them from turning their land into housing is threatened by Governor Brown's budget. The world champion San Francisco Giants try for a twofer as spring training begins. And we look in an exhibit featuring African-American quilts and jazz music. All that coming up next. Good evening, I'm Spencer Michaels sitting in for Belva Davis. Welcome to This Week in Northern California. Joining me tonight on our news panel are Rachel Gordon, City Hall reporter with the San Francisco Chronicle and a baseball fan. Paul Rogers, environment writer with the San Jose Mercury News. And Ryan Flynn, reporter with Bloomberg News. So Ryan, President Obama comes to Silicon Valley and then he goes up to Oregon. Mm -hmm. A lot of to-do, though not a lot of press coverage. Why did he really come here? Well, officially, it was for a talk about innovation and jobs. Uh, other people think that maybe he's here to raise money. But obviously, the big news coming out of the meeting was that Facebook's uh, CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, owns a suit. Usually, <laughs> he's in T-shirts and, and hoodies. So that was the, the big news people were discussing today about the photo that came out of it. Um, but There was another photo uh, with Steve Jobs as well, who on leave, medical leave, mm -hmm. and there he was hobnobbing with all, all the people. And he looked apparently healthy, so my invitation got lost in the mail. I, I couldn't make it to the event, but uh, you know, overall the Valley is doing is pretty well on its own. A lot of private companies are growing on their own without government intervention, so it seems like he could learn something from them maybe about what's driving their businesses. Yeah, but what they say in the Valley is they want federal money for technological innovation and he's saying the government ought to provide that money. Is, is that not a solid well, opinion? Well, he's saying that. It seems like the companies that are growing Facebook is leasing the, the biggest office in in 20 years. Uh, you know, they're going to, Google announced 6,000 jobs they're hiring interna uh, internationally. So they're, they're growing without the, the incentives it seems that some people actually are asking for. What is President Obama actually proposing in terms of high-tech development and innovation? Well, one of the things he's talked about, I think, at a State of the Union address was a, a, a national high-speed internet and that would help people, you know, order stuff from Amazon and help these companies kind of grow their user base. So that would be one thing. What is high-speed internet? Basically, w wireless. Wi right? Yeah, wireless internet is that's fast. It allows you to connect quickly. You know, no dial-up modem pinging back and forth online. <laughs> you, you mentioned that Silicon Valley is doing pretty well. Uh, the rest of the California economy is still kind of in the doldrums. Yeah. Um, how far back has it come? So we've obviously seen a couple of, of busts in the last decade. There was the tech wreck in mm -hmm. 2000, and then the housing bubble, which really affected Silicon Valley badly. So uh, have we bottomed out? Are we, are we well, well past it? Or where are we in the recovery for Silicon so Valley? So the, the State of the Valley report came out earlier this week, and you know, last year the report was very dire. I mean, they said we're not sure if we're ever going to come back from losing 90,000 jobs and, uh, between 08 and 09. This year, it's a little bit more mixed. Uh, private companies are hiring. We're back to 04 uh, hiring levels. Salaries at 64,000 roughly, which is about 05. So we're not where we were in 2000, and that seems pretty far off. But we're not at the very bottom anymore. The interesting we're also seeing, though, the the high tech business kind of in the news internationally. Mm -hmm. Right here at home, Facebook, Twitter was supposed, supposedly had a lot to do with the revolutions that were going on uh, yeah. in in Egypt and even Tunisia. There, I mean, is that does that help too to kind of have that um, cachet, that bump in the news, saying that you really are important? Look what you can do. It's not just helping you connect with your friends, but you can topple a government. Yeah, Bill Maher said that uh, you know Mark actually didn't, wasn't 
kicked out. He actually was defriended by by Egypt. So, uh, <laughs> it, you know, it's amazing how these things are kind of kind of kind of uh, can spur revolutions across the world. You know, and you're seeing the domino effect right now in the Middle East. But what I don't understand is you're talking as though the depression or the recession is over in Silicon Valley. And I'm not sure it is. No, I think people are still hurting. I mean, uh, housing prices have double dipped a little bit. It looks like people are still trying to figure out what's next. The public sector, government jobs, and not just people in City Hall, but you know, teachers, firefighters, cops, they're, they're st dealing with cutbacks to their pensions and to their actual employment. So there are still a lot of people struggling and asking for public services. Brian, can I ask you a little bit about the politics of it as well? We said was Obama there perhaps for fundraising. I mean, mm. we saw President Clinton practically live in California yeah. when he was in office. We saw George Bush practically ignore California. And, and Barack Obama really hasn't been here much since he's been president. Mm -hmm. Do you think we'll start to see that a lot more as he's ramping up for re-election? And mm -hmm. what might that mean for the state to have the president here? And what it, what might it mean for him to be able to have friends or reach out to Silicon Valley? It can't hurt to see uh, the people see him hobnob with you know Facebook and Google. Those companies are creating jobs, they're growing, and they're they're cool companies. You know, people want to work there. So. I mean, when Google uh, said they were going to hire 6,000 people, they get 75,000 applications in one week, and the most in their history. So, you know, and, and a lot of his campaign in a way was through social media, Facebook and such. So I think that as the campaign ramps up, they'll probably see more of them out here. But what he on. didn't do in this trip out here was meet the people. <laughs> he met 12 billionaires. Mm -hmm. They've all given him money, though. They've all given him money, or, or well, the Democrats' they money. They didn't well, give him money yesterday. He didn't <laughs> talk about money. Um, is this just a, a, a an advance uh, billing of what's going to happen in the election, or was he really here for innovation? No, I mean, again, these people have donated to Democrats and Obama in the past, so I'm sure it can't hurt to lay the groundwork for you know what will be an interesting election coming up. And he can't win. Cal he can't win re-election, obviously, without California's 54 electoral votes. Mm -hmm. So um, that's sort of the starting place. I don't think he's going to spend a whole lot of time out here in the election. In 2012, I mean, he he won it's California. State. Yeah, he won by 25 yeah. points, the biggest since FDR uh, last time. But he's going to use the state as a cash register. There's no question about it. So, so Silicon Valley may be doing a little bit better, but what about San Jose? The mayor talked about that recently. Yeah, they're actually struggling. I mean, he, his whole point is that pensions are growing so far and so fast that the state can't keep or the city can't keep up. And so he's looking at saying, look, if we don't cut back some of your benefits. You know, you can fully retire at age 50. If we don't raise that to Social Security level 67, then we might have more layoffs. And the question is, do you want less cops in the street, less firefighters, or do you want to have a smaller a pension? And it's really, it's a big issue people are really fighting over. So the whole valley, politics and economics as <laughs> usual. Thank you very much, Ryan. Paul Rogers, you've been looking into the so-called Williamson Act, a 45-year-old law that, that seems to help some farmers. What's new about it at this point? Well, we've heard a lot in the last month about how bad the state budget is, right? Uh, California has a $26 billion deficit on a general fund of $85 billion. So, you know, the, the deficit is one-third the size of the entire budget. And this is such a massive deficit that Jerry Brown, who has, you know, over the last 40 years been a uh, an environmentalist, a friend of environmental groups, as he's looking to cut lots of things that we're all hearing about, like you know, increasing UC tuitions and taking all the redevelopment money from cities and counties. He's also going after popular environmental programs. And the one that's getting a lot of attention is called the Williamson Act. This was set up in 1965 after LA had really sprawled badly, after Santa Clara Valley, which remember was the Valley of Heart's Delight, a big ag center, had sprawled out. Um, and amid the population growth, leaders at the time said, how do we give farmers an incentive to not sell their land to, to developers. And what they do is a farmer signs a 10-year or 20-year contract, they get reduced property tax rates, and the property taxes that the county loses, that they would collect, is then made uh, partially whole by the state. So Brown has said, we can't afford to do that anymore. We're going to have to zero the state portion out. And it's gotten a very, very rare coalition that you almost never see in California, Bill. Farmers and environmentalists on the same side. It seems to me that in the middle of a recession, there isn't that much pressure to mm -hmm. build. So it might not even be an important point. That's one of the arguments that the Brown administration is making. Um, what the farmers are saying is, look, um, the, the state grows by 500,000 people net 
a year. So if you think about that, every two years, basically, the population of a city the size of San Jose, and certainly the size of San Francisco, is plopped down in California in perpetuity. And that is a relentless pressure in good economies and bad. Sometimes it slows, sometimes it doesn't. But if you don't protect your key farmland, you'll end up like Los Angeles. And it's an amazing fact that a lot of people don't know. Up until 1946, Los Angeles was the leading farm county in California by products sold. So you can lose it pretty quickly. Paul, we talk about kind of the short-term financial boost if they sell this land to developers, but what's the long-term implication to lose California's farmland, even if it's just acre by acre by acre? I mean, it seems that that has been a key industry, obviously, for yeah. California. We have this whole movement now of the local food movement. We really want to be importing uh, fruits and vegetables from Mexico and mm -hmm. from China and who knows from where else, Chile. It, it, is the governor at all looking further down the line at that? Is all, I'm not going to sell the same yeah. state buildings now. I've got to look for a new way to bring money I, in. I think that at this point, they're so desperate for any uh, place they can cut money. They're looking even at popular programs. And there's a pretty good chance that if Brown is even able to get the tax extensions on the, on the ballot in June that he wants, that voters will reject him. This is an off-year election. It's going to be an older, more conservative electorate. And it's going to be hard to get them to raise their taxes. So he is looking for anything. But and, and He's not going to save all that much money with this Williamson Act. That's right. Is he? I mean, wh how much uh, we're talking well, about? Well, the state normally gives about 35 million bucks. Uh, they, last year, they cut it to 10 million. That's what Schwarzenegger did. And so you're right. It's not a large amount. But this is a, a governor who is, um, you know, going after cell phones and cars. And a lot of this is symbolic to convince people, hey, I'm serious about cutting. Do but, you think that the Williamson Act is really a, a terrific program? I read one article that, that seemed to indicate that somebody was claiming uh, Williamson money because they had a vegetable garden in their backyard. Yeah, there, there have been there have been excesses. I think most people would tell you who are in the in the planning business, who are in the farm business, who are in the environmental community, it's the state's largest tool for protecting open space. That's it. There have been um, there have been problems with it. The uh, in Santa Clara County, they were giving these property tax breaks to people with small farms, backyard gardens, basically, and they had to stop. But statewide, and this goes right to your question, 16 million acres right now is under Williamson Act protection in California. That's an area 50 times the size of the city of Los Angeles. It's an area that basically represents about 15 percent of all the land in California. And in Santa Clara County, which has the most land in the Bay Area in Williamson Act protection, 40 percent of all the land in the county is under this protection. So, Paul, if there wasn't this Williamson Act for the protection of the land, are there other measures that local jurisdictions are doing to make sure that the land isn't just developed, that there are open yeah. space I mean, protections? The big question now is if counties aren't going to get any more money from the state, will they continue the program or will they just drop out of it? Counties also have zoning. They have some other uh, protections. But as, as environmentalists will tell you, zoning can be changed with three votes on the Board of Supervisors. And there's a county. question as to whether it's legal to tell somebody he can't develop his land. Well, uh, you can. Zoning is legal. The question is how far do you go? You can't take 100 percent of the value of the property. So, so what happens now? I mean, Governor Brown has has decided he's going to slash redevelopment agencies. There's a whole bunch of things. Yeah. Williamson rise above those, or is it well, just one on the list? The, already in the early committees in Sacramento, the legislators are saying, we're not going to cut this program. It's too popular. Because in some rural counties, it, it actually makes up as much as 5 10 percent of the budget. They're talking about having to lay off sheriff's deputies in places like Calusa County and Yolo County and even Fresno, which gets millions of dollars back from this. So and they're already suffering still from the, you know, the drought and, and the cutbacks there. I mean, some places have unemployment levels of of double digits. I mean, it's really stark. It's yeah, so you're, you're seeing it's almost a rural versus urban type debate. And it, it, to your question, it's all going to get wrapped up in the next month when Brown and the Dems and the Reaps in, in, San Francisco, or in uh, Sacramento hammer out the budget. And, you know, how, what that's going to look like, nobody well, knows. Well, there's, there's big questions there, but thank you, Paul. There's even more <laughs> questions. There's even more questions about what's going to happen at, uh, at the ballpark at Pac Bell, AT&T Park. Rachel Gordon, we're talking about the Giants right now, right. and even I, everybody became a Giant fan, even people who hardly cared about it in the last year. Is that going to happen again? Do you have a clue? If there's going to be a two-peat, it doesn't happen very often in professional baseball. You talk about is it 18T, Pac Bell. Some people just want to call it Willie Mays Field, but it is a ballpark in San Francisco down by the waterfront. And as you mentioned, in October when the Giants won the World Series, the whole Bay Area erupted in joy. Even if you really weren't a baseball fan, it was hard not to be affected by it. Is it going to happen again in the 2011 season? A big question. The team is generally the same team. Most of the same players are coming back. But well, there was, some of them aren't. 
Well, some of them aren't, but most of them are coming back, uh, it, largely intact. And that's been fairly rare with Major League Baseball teams. Usually there's a lot of shuffling in the off season. I think, though, that one thing that happened with last year's baseball team, the championship team, was this magic um, going on. It was a team of misfits, ragtag folks, people who weren't even starting the baseball season, starting the, the season watching games on their couch because they weren't playing. They came in, the, the Giants front office built this incredible team, and it really was this magical moment, and that's going to be harder to sustain probably than if someone's going to keep their arm healthy and their bats yeah, but, going. But, but, the, but the tickets are selling like hotcakes. They are it? selling by hotcakes. People like to uh, root for a winner, and so far we are the winning team. Uh, at least someone has to beat us before we're not going to be the champions anymore. Uh, AT&T Park has been popular pretty much since it opened, and now it's even more so. I think the season ticket sales are up by about 3,500. Uh, single game tickets are soaring. How much People are, are they? Single game tickets? Oh, You've got boy. a uh, Down Depends lower, you lower and field. Also and also the game because of the variable pricing right. this yeah, year. Yeah, dynamic yeah. pricing now. The more popular teams, the teams we hate, like the Dodgers, it costs a little bit more <laughs> money for those games. Weekend games cost more. A lower box seat uh, somewhere near the field costs about 35 bucks, 36 bucks for a single seat. Don't forget, beers are 8 or $9. <laughs> How pop. dependent are they going to be this year on Posey? having a, a repeat year and also when's it come doing a little better than he did last Posey's year. Posey's so their talk catcher. About, yeah. tell, tell us who Posey is. He's Buster Posey was a rookie uh, catcher last year and he did uh, phenomenal and the question is will he have a sophomore year slump or will he come back and do an even a better year? I mean he is one of the most uh, dedicated trainers I think in baseball. People say he's a serious guy. In fact he's one of the only serious guys in terms of personality and demeanor not that they aren't serious athletes but who really doesn't kind of get into the whole joking mood. Uh, t Tim Lincecum we have to go is our ace pitcher. He's won two Cy Young Awards, a young guy. I think he reported to spring training this week with a ponytail. People are going to be like, is, are, we going to, are we going to go forward with that? <laughs> San Francisco has a very, very strong pitching staff, though. It's kind of what kept us there. The question is, will the bats be going as well? We saw it with the Giants at the end of the postseason. That's what helped propel them to beat the Rangers in the World Series. Uh, and they've got some good bats coming in if people can stay healthy. Mark DeRosa, who had hurt his wrist, I believe, uh, only played a handful of games last year. He's supposed to come in with a fairly solid bat. And we've got this guy in the minor leagues, um, Brandon Belt, who a lot of people are looking at as maybe the second Buster Posey, mm -hmm. someone who came from the minors and he's going to make a, a big impact What does he year. play? He plays first base generally, but he has like an incredible bat, and that's something that the Giants have been lacking well, for a long time. Sp speaking of, of bats, I mean, you, you mentioned how difficult it is to repeat. There's been no National League team has won back-to-back -back World Series since the 1975 and 76 Reds, and the Giants did not bring in a new hitter. Right, that was the one thing. They they basically signed just about every player, but there isn't. They didn't get the big bat, and people are saying maybe the big bat is getting Pablo Sandoval to start hitting again. Um, how key is he going to be to the right, success? Right. Let's talk of about big bat, smaller guy. I mean, the, the panda, <laughs> Pablo Sandoval, third baseman. Uh, he was pretty phenomenal two years ago. Last year, he kind of petered out. And one of the things is. He's a big guy. He gained a lot of weight. It's hard for him to get down and get the balls. It's hard for him to get around the bases. He was in a hitting slump. This offseason, though, he worked really hard to get in shape. He even worked with Barry Bonds Didn't he have to some try to get his problems, swing though? on. I, I believe that what reports are saying is that he went through a divorce. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, that could have taken his, his mind off the game as well. But he, too, is coming back saying he wants to make a contribution to the team. And probably a lot of that is to do with their champions. He wants to be a champion and next year. Barry too. Zito, who was their highest paid player for a while, didn't even play in the World Series. Is he going to make a comeback? Well, we're going to see if he's going to be uh, the number five starter, right? He's going to go uh, against Bumgarner to see who's going to get that slot, most likely. There's a, there are a lot of unknowns in baseball, and that's, I think, one of the beauties of the game, that in any game, an individual could be the goat or the hero. You really don't know if someone's going to have a good season or a bad season. And really, every game is different, and every inning is different, and out by out, uh, it really, the, Jane, the game can change. I think all of us have a, have a good future on ESPN. You guys are <laughs> great on baseball as well as the Williamson Act. Thanks very much for being here tonight. Now we look at a colorful exhibition fusing two popular African-American art forms, jazz and quilts, in honor of Black History Month. Textural Rhythms at San Francisco's Museum of the African Diaspora features some of the biggest names in African-American quilting, including a leading artist from the Bay Area.
So this is uh, what's known as free motion quilting. When you don't use a pattern, I just stitch it as I think of something to put in it. With this piece, I've used African prints. This is painted African fabric, and this is mud cloth. Marion Coleman is one of the best quilters uh, in the Bay Area at the very least, but, but probably nationally. She's typical in that she started out um, quilting on weekends, in the evening, and found herself increasingly passionate about what she could do with quilts. She responds to calls for exhibits by wanting to tell the African-American story. For this piece I'm working on documenting the lives of African-American nurses. They were oftentimes not allowed to work in integrated hospitals, so they had their own nursing association. I like collecting the fabrics and thinking about what I'm going to do with it. I started off being a very light stitcher, and the more I quilt, the more stitches I put on. And it creates the kind of texture that you would if you were like, I think, putting lots of paint on something. You know, you can feel it, you can see it. It has a lot of movement in it. This is my jazz quilt about artist Dee Dee Bridgewater. I call this one Sisters. Now this I call Petroleum World. Over the past two decades, Marion has used an incredible range of mixed media to create not just narrative quilts, but also abstract wall hangings, larger-than-life portraits, and grand-scale public art commissions. Once she has a theme in mind, there's no end to the directions her quilts may take. One of the ways of thinking about improvisation within quilting tradition is to say that it's an impulse that's not linked to a formula or a prescription. It doesn't mean that it lacks discipline. It doesn't mean that it lacks know-how. It's just an impulse towards creativity and wanting to tell the story in an unanticipated way. I'll add uh, yarn, shells, probably something that'll make some sound, some, something like buttons or something like that. That spontaneous approach is at the heart of textural rhythms at San Francisco's Museum of the African Diaspora. Exhibit curator Carolyn Maslumi challenged quilters to riff on another improvisational art form, jazz. Well, textural rhythms, we were uh, asked to create pieces about our interpretation of jazz. And so I didn't use jazz artists in my piece, I talked about the jazz mood. So Saturday Night Rhythms is really about people out for Saturday night enjoying the rhythms and sounds of the time. You see them dressed up, feeling cheerful. And I've used family members for the figures in the piece. My mother is wearing the white dress, looking really sassy. She reminded me of a jazz singer. This is a very significant uh, exhibit. The best African-American quilters probably in the world are represented in this. Developing a series of quilts about jazz is showing the parallels between the two. They're both forms uh, known for improvisation. Um, there's not a definite plan. Uh, you may start here and go to there. You see figures, uh, you see Dixieland style, New Orleans style jazz, you have uh, Miles Davis, you know, in his style. And so you'll see the variation in sizes and colors and techniques uh, showing the vibrancy of the two art forms. African Americans have used quilts to tell stories for at least a hundred years. Uh, the first known ones are from a quilter named Harriet Powers, who was a fiercely religious woman. And the only outlet that she had in the 1890s for expressing her faith was through her quilts. She is what I would call the true godmother of us all in terms of doing narrative work. 
the 1950s, 60s, particularly the 70s, more and more women are coming to quilting for the aesthetic impulse that it satisfies for them. And we be begin the development of a real art quilt tradition at that time. I think patrons really should take advantage of the opportunity to look at the quilts from multiple angles. When you step the furthest back from the quilt, you'll get the big picture, the story the quilter was trying to tell, and the way in which it's a balanced piece of art. The closer you get, you'll be able to see the attention to detail, and it increases your respect of what that quilter has accomplished. Sometimes I become so attached to some pieces that I can't sell them, and I decide that I have to keep them for myself. Uh, I've been feeling that way about Saturday Night Rhythms. The person wanted to buy it right away, but the more I look at it, the more I think I may not be able to do that. <laughs> Beautiful stuff. Marion Coleman will give quilting workshops in March at the Museum of the African Diaspora. They're among the many cultural activities surrounding the Textural Rhythms exhibit, which runs through April 24th. And speaking of April, April 8th is opening day in baseball season. We've been talking about baseball. It's, it's a fascinating subject. Thanks very much for being here. So we want you to visit kqed.org slash this week anytime for complete episodes and segments, to sign up for our newsletter and podcast, and to share your thoughts about the program. I'm Spencer Michaels. Good night. Major funding for arts programming on This Week in Northern California is provided by Diane B. Wilsey. Additional funding provided by the George Frederick Jewett Foundation, Helen Sarah Steyer, and Fred Levin and Nancy Livingston of the Shenson Fund.